Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. It has been too long since I've had this guy on the program. You know, just when I, I say I'm not sticking to sports, baseball pulls me back in with this guy. A Baltimore legend, a Hall of Famer. Uh, he's got a stadium named after him up in Towson uh, for the Tigers and his work there and longtime work, not only in Kansas City, Missouri, where my dad always followed his career, but out to Atlanta where he won titles and uh, sent lots of folks to the Hall of Fame, and he's our Hall of Famer in residency. We welcome John Charles back onto the program. John, how are you? How are things in Atlanta? Are you staying safe down there? Well, we're staying as safe as possible, Nestor. It's a little bit uh, topsy-turvy world we all live in at this moment, whether in Baltimore or Atlanta or wherever in these United States because of the virus and and of course, the impact that it had on our economy, and so on and so forth, and what it, and the impact it's had directly on our game of baseball and and all of the other professional sports. So it's it's a it's a bizarre time, but uh, we're getting ready. Our, our organization is getting ready to, you know, to put our 60, 60 player roster together and uh, go get them. Well, for you, I, I would think you were around the last time Haley's Comet was around. You've seen everything in baseball, going back to 66 and Hofberger and your Baltimore background and all that and, our, and your statistics and, and all the things that you were into. I, the, the, there was no playbook for pandemic, was there, right? Like, we've had strikes, we've had World Series, we've had all of that, labor problem, but, but a pandemic. Put yourself back in that chair and how everyone's had to react to this. I think you got out just in time, John, <laughs> managing through this one but from an organizational standpoint for the Braves and I know you're still associated with the Braves this is a very very difficult thing to navigate all the way around and for baseball trying to get back out on the field in a couple of weeks uh, I don't know whether they're going to be able to get away with this I don't know if the, the virus is going to let them well you're you're absolutely right it's the most bizarre circumstance I've ever experienced although not directly because as you said I stepped aside as vice chairman emeritus couple of years ago and and that's the role i still have or the title i still have and and uh and it's difficult uh with the pandemic especially we haven't had to deal with that now we've got a dust storm coming from morocco somewhere in the united states and uh, uh at time from time to time but every team has to deal with this every team has to gather together bring their staff in bring 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 their coaches and scouts in and talk about who do we want on our team? Who do we want on our 60-man 60 60 man, uh, potential roster, et cetera, et cetera? Who we want on the taxi squad? Uh, and, and those are important decisions because if that's, the, if that's the way baseball is going to be structured, and it will be for this season, then everybody's got to operate through in that, in that circumstance to the very best of their ability. Well, it certainly has re-exposed labor relations issues. And, I mean, you go back from the beginning of the reserve clause and all this back in, in your, your era in baseball. Why has labor been so difficult for baseball in your mind? That's a hell of a question I'm asking you, John. But, but why has it been 50 years of so much struggle to just play nice with each other? The basic, the basic reason is with the escalation – of salaries that are being paid to top end players and they have gone through the roof several times over uh that's important to the players and important to the players representatives that is their agents that those numbers continue to increase not decrease ever no matter no matter a pandemic no matter a, an economy that was t that dropped to its knees because of the pandemic uh and, and their view is that my guy ought to make more money no matter what the circumstances. And our view is that we can't pay your guy more money no matter the circumstances because we didn't make any money. Uh, and so, you know, that's, those are all, both sides are, are valid. And uh, it was a very, very difficult uh, circumstance, I would suggest, uh, for some sort of compromise to take place. But thankfully, um, it, you know, it wasn't a compromise. The commissioner had the right to declare what the schedule would be and what the season would look like. And he declared 60 games and, and everybody, every, all 30 teams are out there now trying to put their club together. Trying to put a club together in, in, in this era and doing this way. And I, I, Lord knows what the minor leagues look like. And I know there's been a, a, a big shift. John, I drove down to Nagsett last week. I drove through Bowie and I drove through Norfolk. I drove through both, you know, uh, Oriole farm towns. 
all of baseball, the whole complexion of the minor leagues is going to change dramatically during this period of time as well, is it not? Well, it has changed because there is no minor league baseball. And I, and I don't know, but I doubt very seriously whether there will be a minor league game played at all in, in, in this year uh, because of the, all of the circumstances I just mentioned. There's no revenue for the major league clubs to trickle down to their minor league operations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bizarre circumstance. But, uh, you know, like you said, I was around for Haley's Comet, but now I'm around for the pandemic and, and, and such. Well, in trying to get this right up in New York and trying to get this right franchise to franchise, and I've said out loud, now, you know, I don't think the Orioles want to play this year, right? Like, I don't think there's a financial reason for them to play. I don't think there's a pennant race reason for them to want to play. I think they would wind up losing money. As far as how this has come out into the public eye over the last 30 or 60 days, are, are we heading toward maybe they play now but a, a real labor problem around the corner that they couldn't solve now that is going to trickle down? We only have one year left on the lease here, John. I know I've, I brought this up with you before, and you were here for uh, the Baltimore homecoming last year. I'm very, very concerned about the future of the Orioles here given what the Nationals represent, given the shrinkage in our market and everything that we've had happen here in Masson. I don't know who the next owners of the Orioles will be or whether the boys are going to run this thing through. I live here, though, and it's shrunk dramatically, and I, and I run a business abut- that abuts it. I'm really worried about the structure of all of it and where the leadership is. Well, you, know, you have a better view of uh, my old hometown, my dearly beloved old hometown of Baltimore than I do now because I've been gone for many, many years. Uh, uh, from Baltimore, I went to Kansas City for 23 years and now 30 some years in Atlanta. So, uh, uh, although I do keep in touch with some relatives, but anyhow, I can't, I can't speak to the Orioles, but I can speak generally about baseball. Uh, baseball is like in the old oak tree that blows from side to side. It does, it bends, but it never breaks. And whatever happens, whatever the circumstances that human beings bring to it that cause a great dilemma, that oak tree seems to find its way back rigid and strong and, uh, and the roots stay gro- uh, grounded. And I think that's how I feel about baseball. I mean, that's an analogy, that's, and, and that's, but it's how I believe. Baseball has always withstood circumstances, whether, whether it was nat- uh, natural disasters or whether it was man-made disasters because of the strikes that, ha- that have happened throughout time. And I've, and I've experienced a number of them because I've been around a long time, but but I, I, it's a strong game, Nestor. Baltimore is a strong member of the community uh, of baseball, Major League Baseball. And, and I have uh, very, very strong and optimistic views that uh, the old Orioles will continue to fight on like the rest of us will. Well, you went through this in Atlanta where you had a downtown stadium that people stopped coming to. And Atlanta is a much different story and it's much more spread out. But the, the next life that your organization got – that, that came from your winning all of those years at Turner Field and before that at the launching pad, but it, the, the new environment for Braves baseball, a community that's built around with apartments and all of that uh, out on the freeway, that's something that Atlanta sort of pioneered recently that feels to me to be where other teams may be thinking of going in the next 20 years because it's worked out well there. Well, we were, the, we were the pioneers and the pace setters for that. Once we'd made the decision, six baseball executives sitting around over lunch, as we did almost every day, visualizing what we wanted our next stadium and environment for our fans to look like. Uh, and, and we decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build a stadium, a beautiful stadium, and at the same time, come out of the ground at the same time, simultaneously, with a mixed-use development adjacent to the ballpark. We did that. People looked at us and scratched their heads and said, what are, what are these guys doing? What are, how do they know this is going to work? And it was the smartest thing we could have ever done. We built a great ballpark, We and I had a lot to do with that because I, I, know, I know baseball pretty well. And, and, I, and I had some input on, on the mixed-use development, and it turned out beautifully. And since then, Nestor, we've had virtually every major league club, every national football league club, some NBA clubs, collegiate programs that were thinking of doing the same thing, and they came in to see our project and how it's working and how beautiful it has worked and how successful it has been. 
And we're delighted with that, of course. And it continues to grow. It continues to grow. So that was the right decision to make. And we had to get out of downtown Atlanta for, for good reason. Our fans were having a hard time getting down there, traffic, et cetera, et cetera. So now we're out here in the northern suburbs of, of Atlanta, and it's working beautifully. John Charles, Hall of Famer, joining us here. And, uh, you know, always a Baltimorean, even though uh, he is not here. You can still find him uh, readily available near the Towson campus for all baseball activities. And uh, John, putting this thing back together, it all stops in, in you know, March 15th, right, uh, for, for your organization, every organization out there. We felt like, well, we're down a month, we're down a couple of months. I always felt like baseball was going to be the hardest thing to sort of ramp back up because – uh, you spent 50 spring trainings. I spent 20 uh, just watching pitchers go from, you know, an inning or two to an inning or two or three or three or four or four or five over the course of six or seven weeks to be ready. What kind of baseball are we going to see here? And even for a young old timer like yourself, we're changing the rules. We're changing extra innings. We're changing uh, pitchers and relief pitchers. We're changing the DH in your league. Uh, and you, you, of course, were new to that in Kansas City so many years ago. Uh, the game It's going to be a different game we're going to watch this summer and especially in empty stadiums as well all of that is true everything you just rattled off is is accurate and true and it will be a challenge for we in this business those who are operating the 30 clubs the major league baseball offices in new york uh to deal with and to make this work uh we hope like the devil that it's not what we have to make work for the ensuing years to come but that to get through this pandemic, to get through the downturn of our eco- economic system in our nation caused by the pandemic, to, to, to be careful about when another new spike may come through, and, and, and as it's doing now in a, in a number of states in our union, uh, it's, it's challenging. And we've never had to face this experience before, so there's no game plan laid out for how you're supposed to do this. We just have to make our best decisions. And I and I, like I said earlier, I think baseball has demonstrated that it bends, but it doesn't break. And I think the same thing will happen in this circumstance. All right, so I'm going to ask you a question. I've been on the radio 30 years, and I was born in 68. So my first baseball year that I really remember as a kid was 73, just as, just as a reference point. You know, I remember the 73 World Series. I remember Pete Rose and Felix Mion and all that stuff. I don't remember the, all the politics around the DH because sort of the Ron Blumberg thing, and it was Tommy Davis was our first DH in Baltimore, right? Uh, it came over. He could barely walk, but he could hit 326. Um, the DH, give me a little – school me on this, Professor Sherholz. I mean, give me a little Hall of Fame work on this from 69 and going out to Kansas City to being on the American League side to say, yeah, we'll be the ones to have Hal McCray around here, right? And, and Harmon Killebrew. And Harmon Killebrew. I, a, a, a DH, a <laughs> I had his baseball card, Kansas, that's true. <laughs> and, Can, and Kansas City as well. Uh, I, I've never been uh, a, a, a fan of the DH because I'm, uh, I'm a real traditionalist, uh, as you are, and that's the way I grew up uh, playing the game. That's the way I grew up becoming a part of the uh, industry and enjoying the game. But I also know that the rules were set long before I left the, the Orioles to go to Kansas City expansion franchise and help be- build that franchise, and it was with the DH because it was an American League team. I've always appreciated the, 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 the purity, if you will, quote-unquote, of the National League game because the athletes who are pitchers have to also be athletic enough to put a bunt down or, or to take a swing uh, and not hurt themselves. And, and they, you know that's the way the game that I like. And, and, but I also understand that in order to, to be wide open with your considerations for how to make the game better, how to keep more interesting players in uniform and hitting balls over the fences and, 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 and trotting around the bases, those DHs, we'll see. I, 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 I don't, I'm not crazy about it, but it is the decision that's been made, and, and uh We'll see how long it lasts. You know, I did a little research on this, and I, I didn't know this, but it says Connie Mack first it, it brought this up in the early 1900s. But was Charlie Finley the guy that really – I mean, uh, you know, I talk about Charlie Finley as sort of legend and my, my dad and hating the A's in 73 and 74 and being from Baltimore, but, like, you knew Charlie Finley. Well, where did the uh, – where was the DHI – where was the, 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 uh, the mechanism behind the scenes to make it happen in the late 60s and early 70s? Who were the proponents for it? 
Well, um, you honor me by thinking I was a uh, in the game that long and back during that day, in the day. I didn't give and, you Connie that, Mack, but day. you were around and, in 73. Come on now. And, well, 73, sure, sure. But there were a lot more veteran uh, baseball executives who have been, who have earned their stripes long before I was ever considered to be, uh, give my view of the circumstance. But once they started asking me, I gave it. But, you know, I'm sure, as I said before, smart people, I've been around baseball people, baseball executives, baseball owners, and they really care about the game. They really work hard to make it better, not only their team uh, individually, but for the good of the game. And that's the, that's the attitude that everybody that I've been with in baseball, for the most part, a couple of exceptions, but not many, have, have taken when they're trying to help the game get better. Some believed that the DH was the way to go. Some didn't. So they decided to just de- delineate it by league. You shocked and that it, it took 50 years to get it into the National League? <laughs> I, I thought, it, like, 30 years ago, I thought it would have happened by now. But it, I, 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 I don't disagree with your, your notion about that. I thought it, would, it, it, it might be an accommodation made by, by the National League uh, to, to help the game be the same and it played the same and the complaints that you get from writers or executives or fans especially uh, would go away because everybody's using the same rules and regulations. What about signing players, John, that, that you have a, a relief staff, and Lord knows when Buck Showalter is he's hiding relief pitchers, um, but, but having pitchers and having circumstances that statistics dictate, certainly in the modern era, uh, with, with sabermetricians everywhere, that we've now changed the game for relief pitching in the late innings. It really is going to change all the strategy and the way we view baseball. We're going to have to relearn baseball. Yeah, it, it is. You mean the, the relief pitcher has to face three hitters? Sure. Uh, and he can't. He can't. The manager can't walk out there after he brings a lefty in to face a left-hand hitter, and here comes a right-hand hitter, and then you time out, and you walk out to the mound, and the guy brings in a right-hander, side armor or whatever, and then he faces the right-hand hitter, time out. Here comes a you know another left-hand hitter and another left-hand pitcher. Uh, so that was about, in my opinion, that was mostly about pace of game. That was a st- that was a tactic that the managers used because they thought it put them in the best position to win the game, and it was an aggravation for probably all the people in New York who said, "My God, these games are getting so long and so slow. You know, people are going to have to bring sleeping bags." So, so uh, I think that's what the what the debate was, and and that's that's how it was resolved. John Churros, Hall of Famer, joining us here talking about the uh, grand old game for the 4th of July and hoping to get some baseball back uh, a little later on. I want to go into the Wayback Machine for something because you sat on stage last year at this incredible Baltimore homecoming event. It was great to spend some time with you and see you back in Baltimore. And and you, you told a little story about how you got involved. And I mean, I had to do some research on it. And I had your book from back in the day that North Point Junior High School and Jerry Hoffberger. And I don't have enough people left in my life that have uh, Hoffberger stories uh, that are firsthand in the way that perhaps you did. You wrote a letter to Jerry Hoffberger that got you involved in baseball, and I, I just think going back to that era and where you were and where your life could have gone, uh, because we think of you in baseball, but you had a whole different life before baseball as a teacher. I was, I was an educator. I was two courses shy of my master's degree, going to Loyola uh, a College night school, two courses shy of my master's degree in administration and supervision of secondary schools. And my intention there was to become a principal and make as much money as a male educator could possibly make to take care of my family. And, but the, it burning in me all of the while, you know, my love of baseball, my dad was a professional baseball player. I and mean, I was a decent high school and college baseball player. My son became a professional baseball player. Uh, so, but I just said, you know, baseball has always been my, my goal and I think God has a different plan for me. He was smart enough to know I didn't have the ability to be a big leaguer. So he made me an educator for a while, and I started thinking about it. So I wrote the letter to Mr. Hoffberger, and I, and I sent it to him. And, and I went, I, actually, I wrote it at a free period, and I went home and typed it on one of those old Royal typewriters without electricity and sent the letter to him. He didn't know who the hell I was or who was sending the letter, so he sent it to Frank Cashin, who at that time was running the Orioles. And Frank knew the name right away because my grandfather was a great athlete and great basketball coach in Baltimore. My dad and all his brothers were great athletes. 
And Frank says, I don't know this young man from apple butter, meaning me, but I know he comes from good stock. Let's bring him in for an interview. They had already interviewed 12 candidates for the assistant director of player development or the administrative assistant player development. So, Nestor, I'm now making $6,800 with two courses to go on my master's degree. And I go, to, I go for an interview with the Orioles, which went beautifully, thank God. And they hired me for $4,700. How many teach school, male school teachers do you know leave teaching to make a job for less money? You're talking to the only one that I know. Well, you took a chance, and look how it turned out, right? It turned out beautifully. It did turn out beautifully. John Shuros, Hall of Famer, joining us here from Atlanta, where he still makes his home. Wait, what's the title? Emeritus? I, I, I want a fancy title before it's all over. Well, here's, here's my title. Vice Chairman Emeritus. Emeritus. And I tell everyone when they ask me, well, what, is, what is it? I said, it's the greatest job in the world. I have no authority, no responsibility, and no worries. My well, parking place my parking place is still next to the chairman and CEO un, under the stadium. I have tickets to every game, and and every once in a while, my checks still show up in the in the mailbox. Well, I hope we not get some bit, games for you to pull up for you know sometime soon here, John. And uh, <laughs> uh, for you, biggest concern just uh, you know as an executive and having seen all of this for the safety of the players and the families and knowing what this you know. And I'm worried for everybody. I know you've you've had some some issues down there in your state as well. Just trying to keep everybody safe, but. How is baseball going to pull this off with confidence in your mind that if you were bringing your players in as Braves and saying we can keep these guys well, here's, safe? Here's how you pull it off with confidence, to use your phrase. If you have smart people, intelligent people, knowledgeable people who have foresight and know that this is coming down the road, you can't be shocked. You can't be surprised and say, oh, my goodness, we didn't know this was going to happen. Yeah, you knew. Everybody in the world knew. And so you had to be prepared about the new presentation of baseball that baseball executives were going to have to be responsible and in leadership positions to get done and get done appropriately and properly to protect the integrity of this great game. And I think that will happen. I believe that will happen because I know a lot of the people that are still running that own franchises and that are running franchises, and they want that to happen as much or more than I do even right now. Well, we want that for the Baltimore Orioles here in, in our homeland and uh, want you to stay safe down in Atlanta. John, I'm, I'm so disappointed. I had a flight to Atlanta next Wednesday to see the Rolling Stones uh, down at the Dome there. I'm, me and Pete DeLutis, we had, I had my flight. I had my hotel room in Midtown, the whole thing, and it, you know, it's all off the book. So uh, I, I'm always disappointed when I don't get down to Atlanta. I haven't been to your new stadium yet. I did that tour, 30 ballparks, 30 days. You guys are the one place online that I haven't been yet. So we need to open your ballpark up and get me back down there. To, uh, to, to, to the north suburbs. How about that? Well, you know, there's always going to be plenty of seats available, especially this year. So <laughs> if, you find, if you find a way to get down to Atlanta... I'm sure I can get you a ticket, Nestor. <laughs> well, I, and, and I guess I can be there when the National League guys actually use the DH, which I've been waiting for for 50 years. John, I love you. I appreciate you. Thanks for answering the call. Great seeing you last fall. Stay safe so we can get together again, okay? I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. John Charles, Hall of Famer, Baltimorean, most importantly. Man, and as he pointed out, took a pay cut leaving North Point Junior High School. I, you know, in, in an earlier era, I probably would have gone to North Point Junior High School before Hollaberg was built. You know, we could have traded him up, moved him over to Hollaberg. Then he would have been something. North Point Junior High School, 1966. John Scherholz, Baltimore City College. Always great to have him on. Nasty at WNST.net finds me. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, all over the world. Calm, local, and Baltimore positive.